Hi friends, my name is Baji. Welcome back to our channel. In our previous video, we discussed one of the important script development concepts that is script modularization. If you haven't watched that video yet, I highly recommend watching it first and then continuing this video. Until now, we have covered how to create script for web applications. We talked about different ways to record a web application and subsequently implemented different script customization such as parameterization and correlation. In real time, the client often requests API performance testing alongside web applications. Hence, it is crucial for every performance tester to understand the process of conducting API performance testing. And that's why we are diving into this topic today. After watching this video, you will gain a solid understanding of APIs and the process of testing their performance. So let's get started without any more delay. Before we dive into the API performance testing process, let's take a moment to go over the basics of APIs. So what is an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface. Basically, API is a set of rules, protocols and tools that allows different software applications to communicate with each other. It defines the methods and data formats that applications can use to request and exchange the information. In simple words, we can think of an API as a messenger that allows different parties to talk to each other. Let's imagine a restaurant scenario to understand more about API in simple words. In a restaurant, the waiter acts as an intermediary between you, the customer and the kitchen where the food is prepared. So we can think of the waiter as an API. Now let's continue with the restaurant scenario to understand this concept more clearly. When you as a customer decide on the dishes you want to order, you are making a request to the waiter, right? The request includes details like the type of dish, any special instructions like less spicy food, etc. and the quantity. The waiter process your request and communicates it to over the kitchen. The waiter understands the kitchen's language similar to how APIs use a specific format for communication. Once the kitchen staff receives the order, they prepare the dishes according to the instruction and send them back to the waiter. Here, the kitchen does not need to know who you are it simply process the request and response. Then the waiter brings the dishes back to your table delivering the response from the kitchen. The response includes the food you ordered. Here the waiter does not reveal the kitchen's internal process because that is not relevant to us. Now let's correlate these components into API technical terms. You represent the client making a request that is ordered to the server. Then the waiter acts as an API facilitating the communication between you, the client and the kitchen, the server. Then the kitchen is like a server that processes the request, performs the necessary actions like cooking and send back a response that is food. Your other details are like an API request containing a specific information that the kitchen understands. The food delivered to your table is like an API response providing the outcome of your request. In essence, just as a waiter simplifies the process of ordering food in a restaurant, an API simplifies the communication between different software components by allowing them to request and exchange the information in a standardized way. So here the API acts as a bridge ensuring smooth interaction between the client and the server much like the waiter facilitates the interaction between you and the kitchen. Okay. So APIs can be local, remote or a combination of both. They are not necessarily web based and can function within the same system or across different systems. Now let's understand another important concept which is API key. So what is an API key? An API key is a unique string of characters that serves as a form of authentication and authorization for accessing specific functionalities or resources within an API. API keys are commonly used in web and mobile application development to control access to APIs and ensure that only authorized users or applications can interact with with the provided services. By presenting a valid API key, the client proves that it has a permission to access the requested resources. API keys are often associated with specific access permissions. The key determines what actions or resources that client is allowed to access within the API. This helps in implementing fine-grained access control. Okay. Now let's look at different types of APIs. Basically, APIs can fall into four main categories, public APIs, private APIs, partners APIs, and composite APIs. Keep in mind that different companies might use other terms. So don't be confused if someone uses different terminology. Okay. Public APIs are also known as open APIs. These are interfaces that allow developers to access certain features or data of a service, application, or platform. These APIs are made available to external developers, enabling them to integrate and interact with the functionality is provided by the service. 
For example, Twitter API allows developers to access and interact with Twitter data, post tweets, and retrieve user information. And then Google Map API allows developers to integrate Google Map functionalities, including map displays and routing into their applications. And GitHub API allows developers to access information from GitHub repositories and perform various Git-related operations programmatically. And YouTube API allows developers to access YouTube functionalities, retrieve video details, and interact with the user data. Okay. Next, we have private APIs. Private APIs are also known as internal APIs. They are designed for internal use within an organization or company. Unlike public APIs which are accessible to outside of the world, private APIs are restricted to usage within the organization. For example, we can use private APIs to integrate internal software applications like human resource information system or customer relationship management systems, etc. Sometimes we also use internal APIs to automate the internal workflows, trigger action based on specific events, etc. And then we have partners APIs. Partner APIs are interfaces specifically designed to facilitate communication and collaboration between different organizations, typically business partners or third party entities. These APIs enable seamless integration and data exchange between the systems of partnering companies, allowing them to share information, automate processes, and collaborate on various business activities. For example, financial institutions and e-commerce platforms may use partners APIs to enable secure and seamless financial transactions, including payment processing, fund transfers, etc. Airlines, hotels, and travel agencies may utilize partners APIs to integrate booking systems, share reservation data, and provide a seamless experience for travelers. And finally, composite APIs. APIs. Composite APIs combine multiple APIs. Instead of interacting with individual APIs separately, developers can use a composite API to perform a sequence of operations or obtain data from multiple sources with a single API call. For example, in a smart home application, a composite API might aggregate data from different devices and services to provide a single endpoint for controlling and monitoring various connected devices. Now let's understand different API architecture styles. API architecture styles define the structure, rules and standards for creating and using APIs. Different architecture styles offer varying approaches to how APIs handle requests, manage resources and facilitate communication between systems. So organizations will choose and implement an architecture style based on their specific requirements and preferences. Okay. First one in our list is SOAP. SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. SOAP is a communication protocol. It provides a standardized way for different software applications to communicate and exchange services in the form of messages with each other over the internet. Here we can think of the entity that is providing a service is called a service provider or server and the entity that is consuming that service is called a client or service consumer. Okay. These messages typically use XML that is extensible markup language and it is the preferred data exchange format. SOAP messages have a well-defined structure. It is made up of an envelope element which contains an optional header element and a mandatory body element. The fault element contained in body is used for reporting errors. Okay. SOAP relies on standardized protocols such as HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol and SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol for message transmission. There are two other important components that we should be aware of with this architecture API style. Those are WSDL and UDDI. So how does a client or service consumer know what operations that service provider is providing and how do they know what are the input and output parameters of each operations? And again, how do they know what are the data types used in the services and what communication protocols and bindings are supported? And how do they know how to structure its request to interact with these services, right? So WSDL answers all these different questions. WSDL stands for Web Services Description Language. It serves as a comprehensive description that helps both service providers and consumers to understand how to interact with a web service. If the consumer and provider know each other, then the provider will share the WSDL file with the consumer directly. What if, if there are so many service providers and consumers don't know to whom to contact for their requirements? That's where UDDI will come into picture. Here UDDI stands for Universal Description Discovery and Integration. It acts as a centralized registry where service providers can publish information about their web services including details like service descriptions, contact information and technical specification and consumers can search and query the web services. Okay. SOAP commonly used in enterprise applications, financial services, healthcare systems, telecommunication systems, etc. Okay. Next we have REST. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. 
REST allows different software applications to communicate with each other over the internet. It is an interface that establishes principles to facilitate communication between systems. Any API that follows the REST rules or principles becomes a RESTful API. In a REST API, everything is considered a resource. These can be data objects or services that you want to expose to the outside world. Each resource is uniquely identified by a URI, nothing but uniform resource identifier. For example, HTTPS example, API v1 products. This is also referred to as an endpoint, okay? A client interacts with a resource by making a request to the endpoint over HTTP. The request has very specific format like POST, API, v1 products, HTTP 1.1. The URI proceeds with the HTTP verb in this case, POST, which tells the server what we want to do with the resource. We also have other HTTP verbs like GET, PUT and DELETE. So POST will be used if you want to create a new resource and GET will be used to read an existing resource. Similarly, PUT will be used to update an existing resource and DELETE will be used to delete an existing resource. We can also think of these operations as CURD operations. CURD operations form the foundation for interacting with and managing data in various software applications. Sometimes in the interviews, they may ask what are all the different CURD operations in API testing. Then you need to explain POST, GET, PUT and DELETE operations. Sometimes we also need to send the body along with the request and this body is called payload. The two most common formats for REST API payloads are JSON, that is JavaScript object notation and XML. Once we send the request to the server, then it processes it and formats the result into a response. In the first line of response contains an HTTP status code to tell the client what happened to the request. HTTP response codes are grouped in five classes. Any response with the code between 100 to 199 will be considered an information message. And the responses with the code between 200 to 299 will be considered as a successful response. And from 300 to 399 will be considered as redirection message. Any code between 400 to 499 considered as client side error. That means there may be some issue with our request. We might be sending wrong body or sending a request without proper tokens, etc. And finally, any code between 500 to 599 considered as server side errors. For example, server was unable to process the request due to some issue. In that instance, it will respond with HTTP 500 status code. Okay. The common codes that we generally see during our testing are 200 for successful requests, 400 for bad requests, 401 for unauthorized requests, 403 for forbidden requests, 404 for not found requests, 500 for server side errors and 502 for bad gateway errors. In the interviews, they may ask what HTTP 500 status code means. So you should be in a position to explain about that code. Okay. So please try to remember the code along with the reason behind for that status code. REST APIs are commonly used for web applications, mobile applications, Internet of Things, healthcare systems, financial services, microservice architectures, and many more. Next one on our list is GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for APIs that was developed by Meta, previously called as Facebook. It allows clients to request only the data they need, minimizing overfetching or underfetching the data. The results in more efficient data retrieval, reducing the amount of unnecessary data transferred over the network. Okay. Unlike REST, which often requires multiple endpoints for different resources, GraphQL has typically a single endpoint. Clients can request data from this endpoint using queries and the server responds with the requested data. Okay. GraphQL supports mutations. Mutations are used for modifying the data. It allows the clients to make changes to the data such as creating or updating or deleting the records. GraphQL supports Real-time data updates through subscriptions. Clients can subscribe to specific events and then the server will push the updates to the subscribed clients when relevant data changes. Generally, GraphQL will be used in social networks, data intensive dashboards and mobile applications, etc. Okay. Next one, gRPC. gRPC is an open source high performance RPC framework initially developed by Google. Here RPC means remote procedure call. Before going any further, let's quickly understand about local and remote procedure calls. A local procedure call is nothing but calling a procedure or function within the same program or application. The invoked function gets executed without any network communication. On the other hand, a remote procedure call is calling a procedure or function on a remote system and receiving the results. The core of gRPC is protocol buffers, which simplify the way different parts of an application communicate by providing a structured and efficient method for defining and exchanging the data. It is like having a common language that everyone in the application speaks, making communication faster and more reliable. 
gRPC uses HTTP2 as its underlying transport protocol which provides a more efficient communication layer for remote procedure calls. One of the significant improvements in HTTP2 is multiplexing, allowing multiple requests and responses to be sent in parallel over a single TCP connection. This reduces latency and improves overall performance. Next one on our list is WebSocket. WebSocket is a communication protocol that enables real-time bidirectional communication between a client like a web browser and a server over a single long-lived connection. Unlike traditional HTTP, which involves separate requests and responses, WebSocket allows data to be sent and received by both the client and the server at any time. Imagine you are chatting with a friend in real time. In a traditional setting, you send a message and your friend receives it when they refresh or reload the page. That's like standard HTTP. Now you think of WebSocket as if you and your friend could instantly exchange messages without refreshing, creating a smooth and continuous conversation. Finally, we have Webhook. A webhook is a way for one system to provide real-time information to another system. It allows automated notifications or data updates to be sent from one application, the sender to another, the receiver, whenever a specific event occurs. Webhooks are commonly used to integrate different systems, enabling them to communicate and trigger actions in response to events without the need for continuous polling. One of the common questions that I get from many friends and colleagues, are web services and APIs the same? Let's find out. APIs are a more general concept. They are a set of rules and tools that allows different software applications to communicate with each other. They can be local or remote and they may not necessarily operate over the web. They can be libraries, classes or functions used within a program or between different programs. While web services specifically refer to APIs that operate over the web, they use web-based protocols for communication like RESTful API, SOAP APIs or others. Okay. So you can think of web services or a subset of APIs. In essence, all web services are APIs, but not all APIs are web services. Web services specifically refers to APIs that adhere to web-based standards and are accessible over the internet. I hope now you understand the difference. Please let me know if you have any other questions. After going through all these API basics, you might be thinking what information do we need to gather for conducting the API performance testing, right? First, we need to determine whether the API is an internal API or an external API. Additionally, understand whether any dependencies need to be considered when testing this API. Identify all the API endpoints and methods that need to be tested. Understand the purpose and functionality of each endpoint and the types of requests they handle. If it is SOAP API testing, then gather the WSDL file if available. Okay. You also need to determine the authentication mechanism used by the APIs. This may include API keys, OAuth tokens, JWT, JSON web tokens or other authentication methods. Understand the expected request and response formats including support data, formats, JSON or XML, headers and any required or optional parameters. This information is crucial for creating a realistic test scenario. And then gather appropriate test data that simulates the real world scenarios. This may include data for various API endpoints, different input values and conditions that the APIs are expected to handle during normal operation. Rate limiting and throttling in APIs serve the purpose of controlling the amount and speed of incoming requests to the API, preventing misuse and abuse and ensuring fair and efficient usage. Check for any rate limiting or throttling mechanisms implemented in the API. Understand the limits imposed on the number of requests within a specific time frame. Gather all the peak usage metrics of the identified APIs along with the acceptable response time SLS. Since we are learning JMeter, you must be thinking how do we conduct the API performance testing in JMeter, right? We can use HTTP request sampler for sending the request and HTTP header manager for sending any important headers along. In general, API performance testing is very easy in comparison with web application performance testing because we don't have to record anything here and we just need to configure the API request information in these elements. Okay. As part of our demo, we will use some sample SOAP API requests and REST API requests to understand the API performance testing in JMeter. So let's open the JMeter to create a sample API script for both SOAP and REST APIs. Okay. So first we will try to create SOAP API script and then we will do the REST API. So before we understand the process of creating SOAP API script, let's quickly explore the WSDL file that we are going to use for this SOAP API script. Okay. 
I have already opened it in the browser. This is the sample visitor from dnaonline.com website. So this particular server is providing the calculator service for testing purposes. Okay. So using this calculator service, we can do different math operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. So if somebody wants to have these functionalities in their application, instead of they create it from the scratch, they can make use of this SOAP API. Okay. So whenever we are planning to do SOAP API testing, we need to gather this visual file from the developer. Okay. We can also use SOAP UI tool to validate the WSDL and also understand the different operations available inside that WSDL. I have already installed it in my machine. If somebody wants to install, I will provide you the link. It's very straightforward installation. You just need to go to this website and then choose your appropriate operating system and download the installer and then follow the steps. And they also have very good documentation to understand their user interface. So I will recommend everyone to install this SOAP UI. It's a free tool. You can play around with this interface and understand the different options available so that you can also put this tool in your resume, mentioning that you are aware of this tool as well. Okay, so let me open that SOAP UI. Now we will try to import that WSDL file so that we will understand all the different operations available inside that WSDL. First, we need to create a new project. So create new SOAP project, give some project name test project and then copy the visual file from so let's copy this and then paste it here and click ok so it will import that visual file into the soap ui and will show all the different operations available inside that visual it will also show the request information as well see here it is saying that there are two services available calculator soap and calculator soap one two so this is the new version that they have created. So if I click add and expand this, it will tell you the request information. So this is the request body that we need to pass. And this is the end point. Okay. And there are other things. If you want to add headers, you can also add headers here. We are not going to deep dive in this session about this tool, but just wanted to give a quick introduction about this tool so that you can also download and install it. Okay. Now let's close this. Another thing we can do is we can also remove this question mark with the from that URL, which will take us to their documentation page. Here they are saying this is the calculator service. It has these operations like add, divide, multiply, and subtract. If you click add, then it will show some more information about that operation. Here they are saying they have two new operations, SOAP 1.1 and SOAP 1.2. And inside that they also given the sample request as well as the sample response. So we can use this to develop the script. If you are not getting the visual file from the developer, at least we need to ask them to provide this kind of sample request with all the required headers and the body. We can configure this in the JMeter to test this API. Okay. So now let's create a sample script using this sample calculator service request. Okay. So let's go back to JMeter. So same like web UI script, we just need to add a thread group and then add the HTTP request sampler. Also add one listener to view the results. And since we also need to configure some headers, let's add the config element, which is HTTP header manager. Okay. So these are the two main elements that we need to develop this script for SOAP API. Okay. First let's go to HTTP request. Let's name it as calculator SOAP API. Okay. I'm just giving some name. It can be anything. Now let's configure the information from that sample request. So first line they are saying the post which is the HTTP web and then the the path of that resource and the protocol. So for the method by default when we add the HTTP request sampler it will show us the get method. So we need to change it to post because for SOAP API it is always a post request. Okay. And then we need to configure the other parameters like host name. So host is nothing but in our HTTP request sampler is server name. So let's paste the same value here. And then the path is calculator.asmx. Okay, let's copy this again and then paste it in the path. Some HTTP headers will come by default. So we don't need to add them again explicitly like content length and so on. So let's add the SOAP action header. So let's copy this again and go to HTTP header manager. Click add and add the name SOAP action and then copy the value. So you don't need to copy the double quotation here. You just need to copy the, the value inside the double quotation. So let's copy this value and paste it here. And the next step is to copy the body. Let's copy this body and then inside the body data, you can paste that value. Okay. So this is pretty much we need to do. One final thing that we need to update is the input parameters. If you carefully notice here inside the body, we have add operation and then there are two 
parameters like int a int b so here they are expecting two integer values so that they can add those two numbers and display the output by default they are showing as int but we should replace that int with actual value so this is the information that we should be gathering during our requirements from developers saying that what are the different inputs that we need to pass to test this api okay since this is self explanatory service so that is why we know when we use add we need to use two numbers right so let's replace this int with some numbers okay now let's save this now we are good to execute so let's run the script now we got the response as 404 not found so that means there is something wrong with this request oh okay so during the copy you see here there is percentage 20 added so this is url encoding character i think while i'm copying i have added additional space that is why we got this 404 error let's clean this up so let's go back here you see here there is one additional space so let's remove that and then rerun the script again again it failed let's understand the reason go to the sampler request now this is saying 415 unsupported media type it looks like we are missing some headers let's go to the request and then request headers let's compare with the sampler so we have soap content length content type okay i think the content type by default it is passing as text plain but in the sample request headers they have content type as xml so that is why it is complaining that the current media whatever got passed with that request is unsupported so let's add another header with this content type okay so let's go back to jmeter again so this is where you know we learned the things right we made some mistakes and that will help us to understand what exactly we are doing and then in future we can avoid those mistakes so don't afraid to make any mistakes let's make the mistakes and try to understand the reason and fix them so let's open the jmeter and then let me go to http header manager add the another element space the content type also the value let's copy this and then paste it here okay i think now we are good let's rerun the script now we got the 200 okay so that means our server executed our request successfully so let's go to request and then see headers we have now content type has text html and then go to response data response header so this is the 200 okay and then if you go to response body we will get the response in the xml format so if you want to read this in proper way what you can do is you can go to this text drop down and then select the xml so it will show you all the information in the xml format okay so currently we have envelope inside that envelope we have body so inside the body we have add response and we also have the add result you see here 30 so we passed 10 and 20 right so if you add 10 and 20 the result will be 30 so that is what it is showing here so this is the way we need to develop the soap api script let's add another operation from the same calculator service to understand the one important concept okay okay let me disable this and then add another http request sampler let's name it as calculator divide soap api okay and then go back to the website and then select the divide sample request and response and then do the same thing okay let's copy the same thing again this is the post method so let's select the post and then the server name is dneonline.com so let's paste here and then the path is same calculator asmx let's copy this and then paste it here and also copy the body and paste it inside the body data and we also need to add config element http header manager and then config the to mandatory header elements okay let's add soap first and then add the value for the soap action we also need to add the content type right because it is expecting text xml if you are not passing that then by default jmeter will pass text plain so let me paste this let's save this again and then rerun this script but before rerunning we need to make the value so let's say we have 9 as a integer a and 3 as integer b so here we want 9 to be divided by 3 okay so let's save this and then rerun the script there is some issue let's see unsupported media type okay oh i think my copy paste was not working so let me correct it okay let's save this rerun this again now i got the successful 200 response let's go to response data and see the result as 3 okay let's change the integer b as 0 okay now let's rerun the script this time we got server side error right which is 500 that means server was unable to process the request here we need to clearly understand one thing is we have sent the request as per the expectation but for some reason the server was unable to process that request and that's why it returned the response code as 500 if you go to the response data then you will understand what exactly the problem okay here 
when we are discussing about the SOAP architecture and style, we said there is a fault element which developers will use for errors, right? So here we have this details. So it is saying server was unable to process request. If you go to the details, it also says some arithmetic operation result in an overflow at calculator divide. So there is something wrong with the arithmetic operation because technically we cannot divide nine with or any number with zero. If you do that, then we will not get any results, right? If you are doing this in the application, then application will throw an error. Here, our request is correct. Only thing is our input parameters are not correct. So that is why server was returning 500 errors. If our request itself is something wrong, let's change this to three and then make some mistakes inside the body. And then let's rerun the script. Now we will get HTTP 400 error saying that this is a bad request. See, because our request was not as per the server expectation. In our previous case, our request was as per server expectation, but the input parameters were wrong. So that is why it was not able to process the request and return the 500. But in this case, the request itself is wrong. It's not the input parameter. So that is why it is returning 400 with bad request response message. So you need to understand different failure types so that you can fix the script and then test it properly. Okay. Sometimes our developers or application team will also provide some certificates because whenever we are testing these SOAP APIs, we also need to include those certificates for authentication purpose. Otherwise, you know, we may get 401 errors, which is unauthorized request. So if you are having those kind of certificates, then we need to import those certificates inside the tool. There are two ways to do it. First of all, only JKA certificates are supported. Here JKS means Java Key Store certificates. There are ways to convert any other format like PKCS12 to JKS using key tool utility. We can deep dive in future sessions like after completing the performance testing must have skill series. Okay. But for now, just understand the process. If you have such kind of JK certificates from UI, you can also do import that by going to options menu and then SSL manager. And here you need to specify that JKS certificate file path. Once you import the certificate, then it will do the validation. And if everything is okay, then we can test this service. You can also verify the, the status of that import in the log as well. So if you click this triangle, then it will show the log, right? Here it will show some messages saying that key import was okay. Okay, so you can check that before testing that API. The other way to import the certificate, especially when we are doing the distributed testing, we need to go to the JMeter directory, like software, Apache, bin, and then there will be a file called system.properties. Open this file with any text editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code. So, and here look for javax.net.ssl. So here we need to provide the path for that JKS Trust Store certificate as well as the password. You need to uncomment these two lines and then provide the details. These are the two different ways to handle the certificates in JMeter, okay? If you are familiar with LoadRunner, we generally do this using a function called website certificate ex okay so that's pretty much about soap api testing this is the process that we need to follow to test any soap apis i hope it is clear to you in case anything is not clear please feel free to mention it in the comment section okay now let's save this and create a new script for rest api let's save this as rest api demo same like SOAP API, we also need to gather the sample request and response from developers for testing the REST APIs as well. Generally, when we got that information from them, we will use tools like Postman to validate that API, whether it is working properly or not. Right? So if there is any issue, then we can ask developers at the same time before we actually develop any script in JMeter. Okay. It is not necessary that you have to test this in Postman, but this is one of the way that we will validate the given sample request and response are correct. Okay. Sometimes they will also share the Postman file information so you can directly import that and then understand the different parameters like headers and the request body, etc. This is also free. You can sign up and then install it on your machine and then try it out. Sometimes developers will also give the link to the documentation of the API. For example, let's look at weather API. This is a public API. Anyone can use it. But if you want to use this API, you need to have an API key, which you can create in this website. Okay. And we will also have the documentation page of this weather API, which will tell us what are all the 
the different APIs that are available here like real time API, forecast API and every API if you select that it will tell us what are all the different fields that we need to have it inside the body. Okay. So for any application also if they are maintaining the documentation in Confluence or somewhere they will provide those links. This will also help us to understand what different REST APIs are available for their service and also understand the different parameters required for those APIs. In some situations we also in some situation they also share the swagger tool which will have the same rest apis information for example for the weather api if you scroll it down we can see all the apis information here also the method is get and this is the path and inside that they will mention what are all the parameters that we need to pass like here in this example q and the language and they also give some description about their responses if we are getting responses 200 that means it is okay in case if you are getting any other responses like 400 with this error code 1003 that means parameter q was not provided we need to provide that information so similarly if you are getting 401 api key might be missed or it is invalid so all this information will definitely help us to understand more about the particular api so for our demo purpose we will be using one public api which is an university api using that you can search the university information by giving any one specific name first let's test this out in the browser itself okay if you open a new window and then paste that api it will tell us the response right from the developers tools also we can see more information about this api so Let's refresh this. So this is the request URL and this is the method and this is the status code. If you go to the response, this is the response which is in the JSON format. Okay. So we will use this sample API to develop a REST API script in JMeter. So the process is pretty much same as SOAP API. We just need to add a HTTP request sampler. So let's add a thread group and then add HTTP request sampler and then pass the different parameters. So we go to headers. So this is the URL. Let's copy this and paste it here and then extract the host information and paste it inside the server and this is the path. Okay. So since it is a get request, we don't need to pass any body or data, anything. And then if we go to request headers, I don't think any specific values that we need to pass. So I think we should be good. So let's add listener to see the results okay so let's save it run the script and then verify the results so we got 200 successful response if you go to response data we got the information since it is json let's go to text again and put it json so we can see the information in the json format so i have selected waterloo so it is telling me the university of waterloo information here which is there in ontario canada if i change it to Hyderabad and then read on the same request I will get the different universities that are available with the name Hyderabad so University of Hyderabad Indian Institute of Technology Hyderabad and then ICFAI University Hyderabad so this is a good API if somebody wants to gather the different universities information and their websites are their domain information they can make use of this API in their application okay like I said previously, compared to the web application scripting, REST API scripting is very easy and very simple. What you need to do is you just need to gather the sample request and response, whether it is SOAP API or REST API, and then add this HTTP request element and configure them here. The only challenge will be when we need to add certificates or when we are testing with the token. Sometimes the tokens might be expired or sometimes the token might be valid only for certain duration. So we need to make sure that all the information gathered properly and test this REST API accordingly. I hope it is clear to you both SOAP API and REST API script development. If you are still unclear on any of my explanation, please do not hesitate to mention it in the comment section. Okay. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for staying till the end and supporting me. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or want to share your experiences, please feel free to leave a comment below. All the video notes have been uploaded in GitHub and you can find the link in the description. If you are new to our channel, please consider subscribing for more content and also like and share this video with others so that they'll also get benefited. I'll see you with the next video in this module. Until then, take care, stay safe and keep learning.